others who may not know the Harkis, but we've fallen in love with them, uh, Dee and I, and we've been with them in, in Kentucky. We've been with them, uh, and uh, I consider them a, a voice into our lives. Amen. And he, he lets me know he likes me because he talks to me when I talk to him, so he, he does like me a little bit. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, we heard a word uh, from the Lord this morning. My God in heaven. And and you know what? I hear a lot of words, but I heard the word this morning. And I want you to stand on your feet and and welcome uh, to this house uh, the prophet John Harkey. Hallelujah. Can we give God a shout of praise in the house tonight? We are so excited about what God's going to say in just a few moments. You may be seated in the presence of God. We are we are just so privileged to have everybody out here tonight. And um, well, some of you don't know that uh, Meliana does that dance too. She hasn't done that here, but she dances that way too. So, uh, but uh, she said that uh, she 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 said that oh uh, don't tell them so I might get in trouble you know so, <laughs> but she's an amazing dancer as well as a number other gifts, but, uh, you know, uh, I have to tell you, uh, my, my daughter was, uh, was married, uh, I have, I have one daughter, she got married to a prophet friend of ours that Pastor Cal knows, Prophet David Fang, and, uh, you know, my, my wife, because uh, they couldn't, couldn't find the wedding dress, my wife sewed the wedding dress. And not because not because my my daughter you know wanted some special but that she could not find something, and so it went like seven states or something. She she sold it, but uh, there's something that I uh, that the Lord spoke to me out of that. That uh, she had to she had to have a pattern. She had to have a pattern. And sometimes when the pattern is incorrect. How many know it does not turn out the way it should? You know what I'm saying? And that is why it's so important that we reestablish a different culture here in San Jose. Pastor Cal mentioned something that I don't want to hear. We, they don't have a Sunday night search in San Jose. You know why? Because there's been a pattern. Oh, come on. Are you, there's been a pattern. And it's not God's pattern. It's the culture's pattern. And we have to change the cultural pattern. And what it's going to require is because uh, because if you remember, and I'm not going to, I'm just going to share this real quickly and then give the microphone to uh, my wife. But if you remember that when Adam and Eve sinned, right, the first thing that they felt was shame. Right? Right? Because shame is the first result of sin. Right? So what did they do in Genesis 3? In Genesis 3, they, they found fig leaves, and they sewed coverings. That's what it says. So, right, right, right on. Right, right, right. So, so what happened? So, now you got to understand, Meliana is a preacher. She can prophesy. She can dance. But she's a professional seamstress. But can you imagine the only pattern that Adam and Eve had was their shame? Can you imagine what it looked like? And that is why we have to transform the pattern, ladies and gentlemen. Because, see, God didn't come down to the garden to destroy Adam and Eve. He could have done it from the throne. Come on, are you hearing what I'm saying? He came down to change the pattern. Oh, come on. Because they were partaking from a wrong pattern. The pattern of shame is not humanity's destiny. Because if you don't understand, uh, if you don't understand Genesis 3, you won't understand John 3.16. You follow me? And I believe that tonight there's some patterns that are going to get transformed. How many came to church? I need some some different patterns. Would you welcome the woman of God as she comes up? Give her a hand as she comes. Praise you, God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. It's good to be back in God's house in his presence. Amen. Praise God. You know, uh, I think we felt right at home. Hile and I, 
and she's from uh, Oahu, and we said, man, we felt right at home here. We felt like, again, we thought, thought that we're in Hawaii. <laughs> that was so beautiful. In case, uh, in fact, uh, about three weeks ago, we were in Hawaii in a, a conference. We were speaking in a conference, and there were two other pastors that came with us from here, from the state, one from here, California, another one from uh, Pastor Tom Schaefer with his wife. They were in, they, uh, they came with us to go to conference in Hawaii, and so we took them, and I had a schedule for what we are going to do. We were having about four or five days before the conference, and I had to schedule every day before the conference, and the second day, our schedule was, I told them, you have to go to a hula class, so, <laughs> so <laughs> and I did. I took those passes those pastors into a hula class in a hotel. I tell you what, it was one of the most funniest things I ever seen, you know, because they have to follow the instructions, and they, I don't know if you've been to Hawaii, they, one of the first hula uh, uh, song that they teach you if you go to class, it's called Hukilau. And I tell you what was the most hilarious thing to watch those pastors do a hooky loud dance. It was funny. It was awesome. But anyway, praise God. Are you excited to be here tonight? Amen. Just want to say thank you for your generosity and your hospitality. Thank you again, Pastor Cal, uh, Pastor Cal and Dee. We love you guys so much. We always enjoy got the ch got a chance when we do conferences together with them to get to sit down and hear them preach and bring in the power and the truth of God's word. Amen. So anyway, thank you again. Um, you know, I thought about, uh, about I think it was uh, early this year again, we were ministering in this one state. And I remember I walked in, uh, the secretary sent us an email of uh, the hotel that we are staying. Some of us probably don't know John and I, like what uh, Apostle Cal said, we basically live on a road. We have a home, but we don't live there because of our schedule. We have a schedule of one year in advance that we try to fulfill every year. And because of that, we live in hotels. And because of living in hotels, we earn every privileges that you can earn from hotels. That means we earn what you call diamond from uh, the uh, Hilden Hotel, when you check in, they, if they have a, a, a suite, you have an automatically free upgrade to go to get a suite. Same thing with, we have a free upgrade, I mean a privilege from uh, the Marriott also. We got what they call platinum. Also got platinum with the Holiday Inn also. So you, we earn all these privileges because of living in hotel. So anyway. We got the email from the secretary said that you guys are staying at the hill then at the town where we're going to minister that weekend. And I remember when we pulled into the hotel, John was getting our luggage out, and then I walked into the hotel, check us in. And when I walked into the hotel to check us in, I assumed the girl already didn't know our profile and everything because it's on our name. So I gave her the confirmation number, and she said, oh, yeah, I already checked you guys in. I got the key for you guys, and I said, oh, great. So she handed me the key, and then I thought to wait to stop and ask her what kind of room is it. So I asked her, what kind of room is it, ma'am? And she looked at me, and she said, oh, it's a standard room. And I stopped there, and I looked at her, and I said, do you happen to have a suite uh, available in this hotel? And she said, yes, we do have suites available, but you are looking about $200 more a night. And I was looking at her, and I said, no, not supposed to pay to her. We're supposed to be there five nights. And I said, no, I'm not supposed to pay $200 a night, $200 more a night. I'm supposed to have it for free. And she looked at me like I'm stupid, you know. <laughs> so, and I said, uh, she said, no, ma'am, you have to pay $200 a night, extra, per night. And I said, no, ma'am. And so as I was talking to her, I figured out that maybe I think she doesn't know who I am. So <laughs> after exchanging a conversation, trying to get me the room, and so finally I figured out, well, I think she doesn't know who I am. I better let her know who I am. So I look at her and I said, ma'am, you're looking at a diamond. I'm a diamond. 
with you guys. I wanted to tell her, I'm the kind of person that keep you guys in business. In other words, because you have to stay in the, at the hill then for 60 nights every year in order to establish that we're almost a lifetime with the, with the hill then. You have to earn it every year. Uh, every year for 10 years and you become a lifetime. So we have a, probably a couple more years than your lifetime with the, with the hill then, but you have to earn it every year. So I look at her and I said, ma'am, you are looking at a diamond. And she looked at me and she said, are you a diamond? And I said, yes, I am. <laughs> yes, I am. And she looked at me and she said, give me a number. So I gave her my number and she found it and I saw her change her face, give me a smile, you know, and uh, she recognized, yes, she recognized me. And she looked at me and she said, I am very sorry, ma'am, wait here. So I wait there, and she ran in the back office, and she came back with a basket, water, juice, goodies, snacks on it, which she's supposed to, she's supposed to do right when I walk in. So, but then she didn't do it, and then she gave, and gave it to me, and after she handed it to me, uh, she said, I am very sorry. Let me change your room. So I gave her back the key, and then she changed my room and gave me a suite for free upgrade because of being a diamond. Amen. Praise God. So now, as I got my key and walk into my room, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said, Meliana, I watch you letting the lady know who you are because you know you already earned your status. You know you deserve that room for free. You're not supposed to pay extra because you already earned that status. And you got it because you let the lady know who you are. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said, Meliana, can you imagine all the benefits that are available to you if you know who you are? If only you know who you are. Because of what I already came and done on the cross. Can you imagine all the benefit and all the promises of God are available to you and I? Do you know his word says that by his stripe we are healed. Amen. When we feel sick, there are benefits are available to us. It says, by his stripe, we are healed. And listen to what it says in the next sentence. And by his stripe, we are healed. Forget not all the benefits. It says, forget not all the benefits. Right? What is the benefits? That by his stripe, we are healed. Amen? And all the promises of God are available to us. Just like me with the hotels. My benefit is I have a free upgrade for, for, a, for a free suite. I have a same thing with the airline. We earn all the benefits with the airline, rent the cars because of living on the road. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. If only my people knows the benefit they have, their life will be a totally, totally changed and a different. Again, when you feel sick, Lord, I thank you that by your stripe I am healed. When I face a crisis, a storm, I know who I am. I am the head. I am not, I'm not the tail. I am supposed to lead everything. Amen. Because he am power you and I to accomplish and fulfill everything and live a lifestyle that we're supposed to live if we know who we are. Amen. Amen. Praise God. I think it's about time for you and I to recognize who we are. Listen, if I did not tell the lady who I am, I will be settling in that standard room. And some of us need to look at the devil and say, hey, I know who I am. I am not supposed to be sick and then be struggling with sickness all my life. I'm not supposed to be struggling with lack all my life because of all the blessings and all the benefits that are available to us. Amen. 
Also, I want to encourage you this. Yes, the benefit and the promises of God are available to us. But I also want to encourage you that depending on you and I obeying his word. Amen. We can't disobey his word and show up and say, God, how come you didn't come through with my mortgage payment when we don't pay our tithe? God wants you and I to obey his word and watch his promises being fulfilled in our lives. Just like the reason why I let the woman know who I am, because I already earned the status. I already live in those hotels over 60 nights, so 60 nights a, a, a year. Same thing. Again, there is on, there's many times, many people said, oh, I can't do that and this and that. You know why? I found a lot of people, why they, the promises of God not being fulfilled in, it, in their lives? Because not only because of a, a disobeying, but because of not connecting with him. Because when we spend time with him, connecting with God in prayer and in his word, he will empower us. To obey his word. Amen. He will empower us. But that is depending on you and I connecting with him. How many years were this morning when I share with you about Wally? If you were not here this morning, I encourage you to watch the archive online. It was the same hotel when we, I woke up the next morning. I remember when I woke up the next morning, I look out. We were on the ninth floor. I look out. The air, I was looking out at the... the the strip where the airline was landing and taking off. And uh, there was something, it struck me, and I end up stood right there and watched the airline taking off and landing because you know why? Because the airline they are taking off the, and the airline that are landing, they were both using the same strip. So I end up and stood there and watched them and I timed them because I was in my, my mind, I was thinking, oh, my God, they better not run into each other. <laughs> There's going to be a collision happen if they are running into each other. And I stood there and watched them. How long does it take for the airline, for the airline to take off and how long it takes for the next one to come down? It took only one minute. And I was thinking, oh, my gosh. And I remember United, Delta, and uh, American, they were coming from my right. Hawaiian and uh, Alaska Airlines, they were coming from my left. And when they got into the middle, they were all lining up one by one and take, getting ready for their turn to take off. And, I was, and uh, there were times there were no airline coming down, but yet the airline that are on the ground is still standing on the ground ready to take off. And I was thinking, man, take off. There's no airline coming down. Take off. But then all of a sudden, out of the fog, of the fog, an airline coming out and land. And I was just so amazed how they know their turn, when to take off and when to land without colliding to each other. And we all know this, and I know this. Every pilot, they wear what we call an air uh, uh, earpiece or headset, and who they are talking to. We all know they're all talking to what we call an air traffic controller. So they are the one who are in control of letting the pilot know when to take off and when to land. And I thought, and the reason why they're not colliding or running into each other, because they are communicating with the air traffic controller. And I thought about this. I can't imagine if God's people are taking time to communicate and connect with the air traffic controller. Amen? Because there are many times we are not making it to our destination. We are not taking off in the right time. Many times we saw people, we watch people having a collision, not making it to their destination, or don't know what to do. Why? Because of not taking time, spending time to talk to him through prayer and in his word. Amen? Hello! 
place. It's about time. I can. I'm going to, again, I'm talking to you about connecting with God, communicating with God. Listen, we can afford just to take off when we want to or just do whatever we want to. Listen, we can't do that. There is too many collision. Not only that, you may think, I'll do whatever I want. Listen, we can't do that. Do you know why it's so important for that pilot to communicate with the air traffic controller? Because he's not the only one in the plane. There are passengers in the plane. He is carrying people. Listen, the pilot that flew us last week from uh, Ontario up to uh, Sacramento, listen, he doesn't even know I'm in a plane. I need to get to Sacramento. I need to come here. I need to get here to San Jose. Listen, again, you may think that you, you may think, oh, I don't influence anybody. Listen, you have children. You have grandchildren. You have people that you work with. We have this church. We have this city. We have our state. We have our nation. They are depending on you and I connecting with God and talk to God. Amen. This is not a time we just do our own thing. Please, God wants you and I to make it to our destination more than you and I making it to our destination. Because when we do our own thing, there are people are watching us. Listen, every pilot make it to their destination when, if they communicate and talk to the air traffic controller. God wants you and I to make sure we spend time talking to God in prayer and in his word. And every time the church door is open, we need to be here to fill up, refuel, empower, so we can hear the voice of God, so we can connect with him. Because I am tired watching people not making it to their destination, frustrated, have a collision. But God wants you and I to make it to our destination and take our children with us, take our grandchildren with us, take our church with us, take our city, our nation with us, because God wants to use you and I to take people with us, make it to, to their destination. Amen. Praise God. Give Jesus a big hand clap. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I also want to remind you guys, my husband's second book back there, How to Develop a Prophetic Culture. It has been a blessing. I know churches, they buy 50 books, 30 books, whatever. They, uh, many churches buy it. They use it for uh, they, their Bible study because they have been a, such a blessing. They want to see the voice of God louder than all the noises in this world. Amen. They want the voice of God to be louder in their congregation, in their family, in their children. So I want to encourage you, make sure you stop by, pick up a book after the service. Amen. Give Jesus another big hand clap. Hallelujah. Are you ready for the word of God? Are you ready for the word of God? Do I have permission to preach tonight? Well, ladies and gentlemen, let me just say this. I think Meliana was saying this because prophetically God called us to be pilots. Because of the amount of uh, influence that is going to increase in our lives. And the amount of passengers that are going to jump on our plane. Because they know because we're talking to the air traffic controller that we're hearing from God. And people want to be around people that are hearing from God. Because when you're around people that hear from God, they're, they're, you know that your life is going to be safe. Come on. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You know, tonight, as I was beginning to pray about what God wanted me to say, I felt really, really, really burdened with this word. Everybody say the word atmosphere. Let me ask you a question. How many have ever walked into an atmosphere and you didn't like it. I, I'm sure that I have walked into churches and I could see demons flying around. Come on. I have walked into atmospheres and I did not like it. 
But I found this out sometimes, that sometimes we have a tendency to, when we walk into an atmosphere that we do not like, we have a tendency and we see, we see what's going on, but we don't change the atmosphere. We sort of just submit to the atmosphere around us and allow the atmosphere that we don't like to do the talking for us. Are you hearing me? And so if we go to our work, if we go to a church, wherever our sphere of influence is, then we say, well, we'll just plow through it and hope it turns out better the next time we come. Church, it doesn't work that way. God has called you to change the atmosphere. The reason why he changed the atmosphere is he wants me to tell you this. See, I, I used to think that Jesus fed the 5,000 uh, just because they were hungry. When reality, I've come to, con uh, come to this conclusion that he just didn't feed the 5,000 to show everybody how he can multiply five loaves and two fish. He fed the 5,000 to change the atmosphere. Why? Because in the New American Standard, ladies and gentlemen, it says that the disciples came to Jesus and they said, we are in a desolate place. Everybody say, we are in a desolate place. Now, that is not something I want to prophesy over myself. Come on. That's not something that I want to decree over myself. Because the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Come on, church. I don't want to speak that over me. So guess what? Because of the geography, because of the location, because of the atmosphere, because of the economy, basically they said, we are in a desolate place. I'm here to tell you, by the word of the Lord, within these next six months, God is going to change people's place, that they're coming out of desolation into a place of abundance. Why do, I, why do I know that? Because, see, it, when, when, when they said that, when they spoke that, this is what they're saying. Jesus, because we are in a desperate place, we want you to answer our prayer request. So that means, Pastor Cal, they were praying out of desolation, not out of faith. God is not required to answer your prayer out of desolation, but he is required to answer your prayer out of faith. Oh, hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me. Because desolation said that because we are in a desolate place, we want you to send the crowds away. Now, can you imagine if Jesus would have listened to that prayer? Then the miracle of multiplication would not be witnessed by all those people. Oh, church. I'm so thankful that God didn't answer every one of my prayers. Because some of my prayers did not come from faith. Come on, are you real with me? Some of my prayers came from desolation. But what he did do was to tell them, because they were saying, listen, because, because we've all been in places that we don't like. So because I'm in the place that I don't like, I want to put God in that place. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Uh, you, you know what I'm saying? That I want to bring God into that atmosphere. See, God is not going to submit and come into that atmosphere. And that is why, ladies and gentlemen, he said to them, you feed them. Because the reason why is this. It, it, it is because he wanted to let them know. <coughs> he wanted them to let them know. See, I'm only in a desolate place when I do not have access to the presence of God. But as long as I have access to the presence of God, it doesn't matter if I'm in San Jose or I'm in Belize or I'm in Hawaii. As long as I have access to the presence of God, I am not in a desolate place. Come on. Now, if I'm out in the desert without Jesus, I'm in a desolate place. But if I'm in the middle of a desert tonight, I'm in the middle of a desert economically or physically or relationally. But if I have access to God, I'm going to tell you I am not in a desolate place because I have access to his power. And as long as I have access to his power, then he can change that place of desolation into a place of abundance and blessing. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Because Jesus was not going to submit to the desolation. Oh, come on. Even though his desire, let me just tell you, Jesus is not going to submit to the church's desolation either. 
Oh, nor will he submit to my desolation because he's not a God of desolation. He's a God of abundance. He's a God of blessing. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And I really believe that some of you are coming into a place of increase like you've never been before simply because to change the atmosphere. You know why I want to be blessed? To change the atmosphere. Not so I can drive a nice car. Not so I can just live in a big house. Not so I can impress people, but so I can change the atmosphere. Oh, hear me, hear me, hear me. But so, he mul- when he said you feed them, basically he's saying, because I want to show you that it doesn't matter where you're living, whether you're in Africa or whether you're in America, I'm still the same God. My presence, if you'll access my presence, I can bring multiplication out of nothing. Are you hearing me? Because here's what God does. We're going to turn to a very familiar passage of Scripture that many of you heard. However, I'm going to preach it a little bit differently. Because I have, I, 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 I'm of this persuasion. God put us in a nation of desolation spiritually. I was not born during Azusa Street. I praise God for the spiritual past that I've got. But I've been born right now, ladies and gentlemen. And I have been born right now to change the atmosphere of what's in front of me. Are you hearing me? So therefore, when at, when the atmosphere does not represent what God wants it to look like, I am not going to submit to it. Are you hearing me? So you notice this. Now look at Ezekiel 37. I want you to see this. I want you to see this. It says, the hand of the Lord was on me. Everybody say, the hand of the Lord was on me. Turn to your neighbor say, the hand of the Lord is on you. Now most times when you hear that word, the hand of the Lord is on you, that means, wow, if, the hand, if God's hand is on me, then I'm living in Hawaii. I got me a condo. I'm flying my Learjet. I'm putting my feet up, and I'm relaxing. That's what the hand of the Lord's on me looks like. Church, that does not mean that, that, you know what? You could be going through hell, but the hand of the Lord is still on you. Come on, uh, come on, church. You could be going through stuff, and it doesn't mean that the God's hand isn't on your life, ladies and gentlemen. Because <laughs> we have a tendency to think that only, only when God does something good, the hand of the Lord is on him. But notice what he did. Because... He says, he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of what? In the middle of Maui. Come on. He set me in the middle of a valley. It says valley first. A valley. So you mean to tell me, preacher, that God put his hand on me and put me in a valley. Now, you got to understand where Ezekiel was. Ezekiel wasn't by the river. Because in Ezekiel 1, and you got to understand that Jeremiah and Ezekiel are, are, are constituents. They, they, they literally are contemporaries. Jeremiah's in Jerusalem. Ezekiel was part of the first exile. And now he's a part of this the group of Israelites who were exiled. But God put him by the river. I love being by the river. Because by the river, I get healed. Come on, church. I, I, by the river, I get refreshed. By the river, I get the blessing of God. I get, I get miracles by the river, ladies and gentlemen. But I want to tell you something right now. But, but what, happens, lady, uh, what happens sometimes is this, is that, is that sometimes we get addicted to the river. And anything that doesn't look like the river can't be God. We can get addicted to revival. We can get addicted to the move of God rather than sometimes what God will do. I'll pick you up and I'll put you in a valley because that's where I need you the most. Oh, come on. Oh, come on. Because I'm a, see, listen, I'm a disciple of the Lord. And because I'm a disciple of the Lord, I don't have permission to, to do what I want to. That means that he chooses the place where I go and worship. Because a lot of people say, it's my money, it's my house, it's my life. It ain't your money, bro. It ain't your house. It ain't your life. It's God's. Oh, hear, hear, hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me. You follow me? 
So when we say, oh, God, put your hand on you, sometimes people don't know what they're asking. That means I'm taking ownership of everything you thought you worked for. That it doesn't belong to you anymore. It belongs to me. And if I tell you to give it all away, you give it all away. Oh, hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me. When the hand of the Lord is on somebody, come on, church, there are no options. You don't vote about it. You don't deliberate about it. You have to obey it. Come on. See, what God will do is God sees, because I really believe that God is raising up Ezekiel-type prophets. People that God will literally allow God to put their hand on them and actually pick them up and put them places where they're needed the most. Because most times, I'm going to be a prophet, so they'll put me up on the platform. <gasps> they'll put me up, and everybody will like me, and, they'll, and I'll get a big offering, and people will like me, and they'll, they'll buy my books and buy my tapes, and, and, and I'll have a lot of Facebook friends. That's, that's what I want. No, 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 no. Sometimes God will pick you up and put you in a valley, man, because he's using that valley. Oh, he needs you there. That's where he needs you. I need you in that place of brokenness. I need you in that place of desolation. I need you in that place of lack. I need you in America right now. I don't, I didn't need you 100 years ago. I need you right now. I need you in San Jose right now. In the middle of a valley. But it wasn't just any valley. See, because, because, because I, I know some people. God puts them in a valley. Oh, it's the devil. It's the devil. It's the devil. It's the devil's valley. I'm in a valley, Pastor. Apostle, I'm in a valley. I've been in a valley for 30 years. It's the devil. It's the devil. But they've never changed the atmosphere in the valley. Oh, they can quote the word. They can give money, but they never realize that I put you in the valley because the valley does not look like what I want it to look like. What is it? Not just any valley. A valley full of bones. I want a valley full of money. A valley full of people. A valley full of blessings. A valley full of abundance. No, he picks him up out of a river. I'm having, I'm having river encounters, and now, God, you're putting your hand on me, and you're putting me in a valley full of bones. I did not sign up for this. Why did you put me in a valley full of bones? Because you, you put me in this valley where people are disconnected. They're, they, 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 they're indecisive. They, they're confused. They don't know their right hand from their left hand. They, they seem not to make the right decision. They, 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 they think that they, they think that they, they, they can get high and forget about their life. They, they, they have this identity crisis. They wake up one morning and think they're a girl. Why do you put me in that valley? Why don't you put me in a valley where people are healthy? Oh, come on, church. And this is, this is the thing about the prophetic that we've got to understand. Every prophet in the Old Testament was raised up when there was unhealth in the nation of Israel so that God's word and God's voice could prophesy health into broken areas. Are you hearing what I'm saying, church? But we've gotten so used to prophesying over each other. Come on, church. Now, notice this. Notice this. Full of bones. So these bones aren't together. There's no unity. Well, how am I going to release the Spirit of God when there's no unity? Oh, come on. Wait, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. I, I mean, and they're scattered all over the valley, literally. I mean, they're spread out. They're not even together, not even just a pile together. At least if there was a pile, I could figure it out and try to put things back together. How am I going to find a rib over here and a knee bone over here and an elbow over here? How am I going to put the body back together in this kind of condition? 
Oh, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, church, that is a condition because God has called you to put the body back together when the valley is full of bones. Why? Because the word of the Lord is more powerful than what you think and what you see. Oh. But this is this is a fact. This is a fact. This is a fact. See, we bury our dead. Because Ezekiel is you know, he's a priest, he's a holy man. And now he's walked in, in a place of deposit. But some of you have to wake up tomorrow. The atmosphere ain't like this. You got to go back over there, that job, that place, that home, wherever you live. You have to walk into a place of brokenness and deposit. Are you hearing me? You have to walk in a valley of dry bones. And sometimes we pray, oh, God, get me out of there. God, get me out of there. Get me out of here. I can't function. But boy, you can function in church, but you. Oh, come on. <laughs> Church, you know, the thing is, we got to learn to function whether in church or whether out church because that same atmosphere that's in here has to go out there. Oh, come on, or else it's not authentic. If I, if I, can prof- if I can't prophesy uh, out there, I have no business prophesying in here. Here's the reality. We have to walk in this place of darkness. I mean, but not only that. See, every culture buries their dead to show them dignity, honor, and respect. And here you have bones exposed to the element. Because as a nation, Israel had lost their dignity, honor, and respect amongst the nation. See, you've got to understand, the voice of God is not spoken to our mouth to prove to people how accurate we are. It's to give a culture back dignity, honor, and respect. And there's a lot of people prophesying here. But if we don't prophesy out of a heart of dignity, honor, and respect, we should not be prophesying. Oh, come on, church. Because it's not how accurate you are. It's how accurate your heart is. Well, come on, Oats. The heart has to be accurate on the inside. The heart has to be accurate on the inside. Because here is Ezekiel. So this is a medical fact. Right now, a forensic scientist could go to a cemetery and dig up a grave and pull out essential DNA and identify but Ezekiel is in a valley full of bones where those bones have been exposed to the elements over a long period of time. So this is a medical fact. When bones are exposed to the elements over a long period of time, they cannot pull out the DNA to identify who those people are. So why did I put you in the valley, ladies and gentlemen? I put you in the valley because I want to want you to give people back their identity. Oh, come on, church. See, I don't find, see, let me just tell you, I do not find my identity in my position. I don't find my identity because I'm a prophet. I find my identity in Christ. Oh, come on, church. That's why Meliana could walk up and say, I'm a diamond. Come on. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Because if you don't know who you are, guess what? When someone else tells you something, they all believe that. Come on, church. But when your identity is in him, you can be in the middle of a valley. Look out, valley. Here I come. I'm going to transform this valley. Because Oh, I feel like preaching right now. Because, ladies and gentlemen, see, see the, the culturally, they had lost identity. As a nation, and God had to put a, God had to put a prophetic voice in a place where there was no identity. The prophetic voice is simply given not to tell us how blessed we're going to be in the future, but to give us an identity in Christ that we never lose. Are you hearing me? No matter where we find ourselves at, you got to see this. He left 
set me in the middle. He didn't put me in the outskirts. He kept me in the middle of it. Put me in the middle of a mess. Put me in the middle of a chaos. Put me in the middle of, uh, 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 of people. Put me in the middle of the confusion. Not to submit to the confusion, but to speak truth in the middle of confusion. Listen to this. It says, I love verse 2. Notice what it says here. He led me back and forth. Everybody say, everybody say back and forth. Turn your neighbor say back and forth. Now, why would he use that verbiage? Let me just tell you. The reason why he used that verbiage is because every one of us in here, how many have ever been in the valley? Some of you are right now. And we don't like the atmosphere sometimes. But see, none of us in this room can be exposed to evil 24-7 and not have that affect us. Because just because I may walk in a place of defile, defilement doesn't mean I have to be defiled. You follow me? Just because I have to walk in something that's evil, walk in the middle of evil, doesn't mean I have to have to allow the evil to affect my heart. You follow me? That's why the prophet was led back and forth. He went in, and then God took him out. Because even the prophet couldn't live in that valley forever. That's why you were not designed to live in a valley forever. You were not designed to be in lack forever. You were not designed to be sick forever. You were not designed to be broke forever. You were not designed to be depressed forever. Somebody is, whoa, come on, church. You, that's not what you were supposed to be designed for. He led me back and forth. Now, I'm writing my third book. I'm almost done. I got about 2,000 words to go. And... I wrote 5,000 words just on these two words that I'm going to say to you right now. Because notice what he says here. He led me back and forth among them. Everybody say among them. Why did he use that word among them? Because Ezekiel is by the river. And sometimes in a place like this, where we got a great preacher, we got a great worship team, sometimes we are oblivious to the things around us. So what God has to do is God has to put us in a valley so we start walking among people that are different than us. Because, see, if I don't walk among you, then I don't know your needs. Because, see, as a prophet, I'm not given permission to prophesy over people I'm not willing to walk among. As a prophet, I am not given permission to prophesy over people that I am not willing to walk among. Because I can't prophesy from a distance. And the problem, this is why we have conflicting voices in the country. We got, prof, we, got, we, got, we got people prophesying stuff, and they ain't walking among the people when they don't even know their story. They don't know their pain. They don't know their need. They don't know their cry. Are you hearing me? They just spew off something. You follow me, church? See, this is why, see, because this is why we don't have accountability, because at a distance, I, you, I don't have, see, if I'm with you, you got to hold me accountable. But, I've been, but if I'm prophesying up in Montana about something that's happening in California, you don't have to hold me accountable. Are you hearing me? Because I'm prophesying from a distance. You don't have a right to prophesy from a distance. You only have a right to prophesy over people you're willing to walk among. Because, ladies and gentlemen, see, see, see when I walk among you, I, I see your story. When I walk, see, the, the problem, you know, that's why we got to be very, very careful that we don't allow media to shape our perspective. Because media attempts to walk among things or people that they don't know nothing about. <laughs> so they'll paint a portrait 
and get a whole group angry at another group. When you've never really walked the street with them people, you never held their hand. You, you, you never walked among them, and you don't feel their pain. You don't feel their cries. You don't know what their dreams are. You've never climbed in their heart and to find out what makes them come alive. You don't know their culture. You don't know what the, you've never walked among them. So you think you've given permission to, see, that's why God had to put Ezekiel among the valley of dry bones, ladies and gentlemen. And that's why he's putting prophets in places where they're needed the most. Because if we don't walk among them, we'll judge them incorrectly. We will not see from what I call human need and divine emotion. See, because God is emotionally attached to his people. Those people are my people. They're my people. They're scattered and disconnected. They're my nation. They're, they're my chosen. They're my royal priesthood. These are my people, and I want you to walk among these people. Why? Because see, most people have what we call sympathy. Feel sorry for you. Feel sorry for you. But God wanted the prophet to have what we call empathy. Because empathy is different ears, different. See, this is why, listen, if you if God's raising you up to be a prophetic voice, you shouldn't prophesy over somebody that you don't have empathy. What empathy is, is empathy means I don't just feel sorry for you. I feel with you, and I want to do something about it. Okay, hear me, hear me. And so, so, see, because sometimes we hear somebody's story, but we don't only know part of the story. We see somebody commit a crime that we look, and it's so horrendous, but we only hear the crime. Oh, I'm all, oh, come on. We don't hear the whole story. And so we make an assessment about somebody because of what they did when we really haven't walked among them. Oh, I'm so thankful that Jesus walked among people. And if Jesus walked among people, then I'm supposed to walk among people. And so people jump, uh, uh, jump on a bandwagon based on what se someone says and, and, and rather than walking among people because when I walk among you, this is exactly what happens. I fall in love with you. Oh, come on, church. I begin to feel for you. I begin to say, what can I do as a man or of God to do something about it? Are you hearing me? That I'm not going to just sit here and prophesy and hope things are just. I'm going to walk among you to see. Oh. Because God had to show the prophet what, he, what God was seeing. Now, the people in the natural look like people. But in God's eyes, they were scattered, they were bones, and they were broken. They were in disarray. They were in lack. So I'm going to have to pick you up because you just by the river, bro, in your own little world, in your revival world, bro, and I want to put you in the valley so that you would see what I see. Because when you would see what I see, you feel what I feel, period. Because you can't be a prophet unless you feel what God feels. <laughs> because a lot of people say, because I'm a prophet, I can tell you what. You can You better make sure you feel what God feels about that person you're prophesying over. Because if you don't feel what God feels about that person, you are not prophesying out of the right spirit. Come on. It's coming from your head. It's coming from you wanting to impress somebody. Oh, come on. Look how good I am. Look how bad I am. I know your address. I know your name. That doesn't impress people. Well, uh, that doesn't impress God. But what impresses God is when you walk among the people and you say, I'm with with you. I'm here to fight for you. I'm here to see you delivered. I'm seeing you set free. I'm here to see you saved. I'm seeing you here to get connected. Are you hearing what I'm saying tonight? Empathy. Can I preach a little bit? Because, because, uh, you know, I, I, I shared this earlier right before I introduced Meliana. Do you know that actually Genesis 3 is the only time in the Old Testament where God physically set foot on the soil. Because 
does what? Because, see, when Adam and Eve disobeyed and ate the fruit, see, what did the enemy say? The enemy told Eve that if you eat this fruit, you will, it will give you knowledge and your eyes will be open. Let me just tell you, ladies and gentlemen, there's just certain things I don't want to see. Because there's a power in innocence. You follow me? And yes, yeah, yeah, yes, Andrew, they, when they ate the fruit, what the enemy said was partly true. He just didn't tell them what their eyes would be open to. Uh, uh, right? They did have their eyes open, but they were open to shame. I don't want my eyes open to, to, to sin. I want my eyes open to God. I want to his presence, to his power, to his grace, to his protection. That's what I want my eyes open to. And because shame entered in, the, the first thing that the human person does when they, now you've got to understand, they have never felt shame before in their entire life. Now can you imagine not knowing what you felt, you get that you have this shame come on you, and, and you've never felt it. Because the Bible said earlier in Genesis 2 that they, they were naked and felt no shame. So why did God come back? Because, see, here's the problem. Because Adam was given a voice. given a prophetic voice. God had to undo the shame in Adam and Eve because God could not allow Adam and Eve to prophesy out of their shame. Because then you would have put shame on creation. Oh, come on, church. You would have shamed everything that I created to be good. See, that's what shame does. Shame just, just prophesies shame over everything. See, that's why we got to walk among people. And so that's why God walked among Adam and Eve in their state. Now, now you got to see this. So what did they do when they, when they, when they ate? They sowed the fig leaves, as I, uh, as I shared. What did they do? It said they hid among the trees in the garden. Because, uh, uh, because the thing is, is why would you hide from somebody that loves you? Why would you hide from the grace that sees it all anyway? Why would you feel like you have to hide? Because shame will make you feel that you have to hide yourself from someone who wants to set you free. Shame will cause you to think that God's mad at you when he's not mad at you. Shame will think that God come to punish you. Because if God really wanted to punish Adam and Eve, he'd have done it from his throne. Oh, come on, church. He didn't do that. He came in and, and then they're hiding behind the tree. And the Bible says they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the cool of the day. Everybody say, heard the sound. Which tells me when people say, I don't know if I'm hearing God. Let me just tell you, you were created to hear God. That means that God has a distinct sound. He don't sound like depression. He don't sound like shame. He doesn't sound like addiction. He doesn't sound like, like sadness. He doesn't sound like that. Are you hearing me? He doesn't sound like disease. He doesn't sound like sickness. He doesn't sound like poverty. He has a distinct sound, ladies and gentlemen. Says they heard the sound of the Lord in the cool of the day, which means this. They heard the sound even after they disobeyed. Which means that every person ever born with God was made and created by God to hear the sound. You gotta understand. See, nobody really thinks how God thinks. We focus on the sin nature, not the God nature. That's why we're still deep in the sin nature, because we're not focusing on the nature of God. And so, what happens is this: when He's walking, this is the first time that God walked alone. What's going on with humanity that they don't want to walk among? This means. 
what's going on here? The, because I have never had, I, I've never been alone in this garden when creation was there. I've never walked alone. See, people don't think about the fact that why does God have to walk alone and how sin separates me from God so God has to be alone. We don't think about that. Because we think about, oh, God, i got to get uh, about the sin instead of realizing that God doesn't want to be separated from us. Oh, Jesus. I want him alone. So in that place of walking alone, now he knows what's going on. He knows all he, he said. Where are you? How come you're not walking with me? Because, ladies and gentlemen, it's not that God doesn't know where Adam and Eve is. It's humanity that doesn't know where they are. It's Adam and Eve that doesn't know where they are. Because what shame does is shame, see, it's just like trauma. Any, see, this is why trauma is so devastating for some people, because it stills your voice. It silences you. Hide behind the trees. You can, you know what? A preacher can hide behind the tree of the pulpit. The worship team can hide behind the worship team. We can hide about all kinds of trees, and that's important to get rid of our trees. Because I don't want to hide from someone who wants to heal me. Oh, come on. Because I don't want to. I, 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 because And then we try to find people because Adam and Eve are together. So they're going to reinforce each other. So you know what? Because when I feel shame, I look for people to gravitate to that feel the same way I do. Oh, come on, church. That I can, we, can, we can get in our own corner and have our only shame party. Come on, in our shame clip. Now, hear me, hear me. Where are you? That's what he said. Adam hears the sound. Comes out of the tree. God asked him the question, how come you hid from me? You've never done that before. How come you're not walking alone? How come you're not walking alone with me? Now, again, God's not trying to get information from Adam. He's trying to get a revelation to Adam. This is what he said. I was naked. I was naked, and I felt shame. You know what God said to me? He said the famous prophetic words. Who told you that? Who told you that? Who told you you couldn't get healed? Who told you you were bipolar? Who told you you were poor? Who told you you were sick? Who told you you couldn't get an education? Who told you you couldn't own your own business? Who told you you couldn't dance? Who told you? Who told you? Because I didn't tell you that. Oh, come on, church. See, when I walk among people, I change their conversation, ladies and gentlemen, and prophesy, who told you you were disconnected? Who told you that I care about you? Who told you I didn't feel for you? You see this? He led me back and forth among them. And I saw a great many many bones now because the more I walked among them the more messy it got oh come on church the more I walked among it the more I saw more bones on the floor of the valley the bones were what the bones were what very dry everybody say very dry well I thought they were dry but once I walked among them I didn't realize they were very dry <laughs> Now, let me ask you a question. What is the next step after very dry? Dust. Dust. So why did God put the prophet in the valley? 
see, this is why the church needs the prophet. This is why we need the work of God. Because God doesn't want humanity to turn to dust. Come on, church. That before you go to dust, I'm going to send the word that's going to resurrect you. Are you hearing me? Before things go to work, from bad to worse, I'm going to send a word that brings you back to life. Before you go to dust, I'm going to bring a resurrection. Come on, church. Before humanity gets worse, I'm going to... Re- oh, see, we don't understand that. It's the, it's the cross story right there. But you got to see this. you got to see this. I'm going to start... I'm going to land this plane in just a second. You got to see this. So here he is. It's very dry. He sees the condition. I've never seen this. In, in all, I've read this before. I've preached Ezekiel before, but not like this. In verse 4, this will be our last verse here. He asked me. Again, God's not asking the prophet because he's looking for an answer from the prophet. He doesn't ask me a question because he doesn't know. He already knows what he's going to do. He doesn't need my information. Even though we live in the Silicon Valley, we're not as smart as God. (laughs) Are you hearing what I'm saying? My my iPhone, I really like my new iPhone, but but the bottom line is that it's as smart as the creator of the universe. So come on. Listen to this. He asked me, son of man, can these bones live. Everybody say, can these bones live? Now, church, Ezekiel had been walking among the bones. And when you walk among things like that, the possibility of wondering if they're ever going to come, come to life doesn't look good. Right? It looks worse. Come on, because now what he's walking among, it's worse than I thought it was. Come on, church. You sent me down to the projects. I thought it was bad. But when I walked among the people, I really didn't realize how bad it was. And once you walk in that, and the thought in your mind of everything it coming together, that's not the thing you thought in your mind. But the reason why God asked Ezekiel the question is, can these bones live is because the prophet never thought the bones could live. The pro- it never entered the prophet's mind that the bones could come together. And what God had to do is God had to put a divine thought in Ezekiel's mind, ladies and gentlemen. Because if God doesn't put a thought in our mind, guess what? We're going to submit to the atmosphere. So what happens is God has to put his idea, put an idea. I never thought of that, God. I never, it never crossed my mind that the bones could live. I just thought you had me walk among this valley to show me how bad it was. No, I didn't, I didn't have you go in the valley to tell you how bad it was. I put you in the valley because I know you're carrying a word that's going to change the valley. Come on, church. How many believe you're here carrying a word to change the valley? And what I want to put is an idea in your mind to believe me that nothing is impossible. These bones can live. Your family can get restored. Your kids can get born again. Oh, come on, church. You can own your own home. Oh, hear me, hear me, hear me. I don't care if the home is a million dollars for a two-bedroom. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, it's too expensive here in the Silicon Valley. Is it too expensive for God? Is it too much for God? God has you walk among these because he wants you to, pro- oh, hear me. What we do, we submit. Because the prophet was about ready to submit to the atmosphere of the valley of the dry bones. And what happened in that place is when he was submitting to that atmosphere, God had to say, stop. Because you know what? I can't let you continue. Because you might prophesy something that I did not tell you to prophesy. Church, let me just tell you. I don't want to prophesy death over something God wants to work in my life. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Because, see, 
going to tell him. I think I was telling him, telling him earlier that, that we're, when we're talking about reflecting grace up here, we're talking about keeping things open. I'm still on that thing. That how I got that message was there was a particular uh, a pastor that I have influence in their church. And he was having problems with an individual in their church. And she was very anointed, prophetic. She was teaching. And what happened was he was having a conflict with, with her. He called me, asked me what I thought she, he should do and what the word was. And I said, you know what? You need to use her. You need to elevate her. You need to promote her. But I'm having a conflict with her. I said, well, promote her and you won't have a conflict with her. Because isn't it like God to do something opposite of what we think? You see, in the end was affirm her, value her when you don't feel like valuing her. And see what God does. Okay? That's what I told him. Well, this other prophet showed up and told the pastor, a few weeks later, told the pastor, oh, she has an Absalom spirit. Well, when that prophet spoke to the soulless realm, it gave the pastor permission. I was right all along. They really have an Absalom spirit. So, so then, because they have an Absalom spirit, there's no possibility of reconciliation. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, you got to see this. Because you've got to understand that every one of God's purposes, he didn't, give me the, uh, he didn't give me the ministry to identify what spirit you got. He gave me the ministry of reconciliation. Oh, come on, church. I realize that there are Absaloms. I realize that there are Jezebels. I get that part. But the church has been on the bandwagon that everybody they don't like must be a Jezebel or an Absalom. And we're wondering why the prophetic is getting a bad name rather than realize it's the ministry of reconciliation and bringing people back to the knowledge of God. And listen, church, my heart, if someone has got that spirit, my heart should be I want them restored. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I don't want them punished. And church, church, when that happened, I had to tell you, I was angry. I, I wasn't angry at the, at the pastor. I was angry at that other prophet. And I happened to know that the, the person's covering very well. And I was thinking of calling the person's covering and telling him, you know what your prophet just did? And then the Lord checked me. He said, Ricky, he said, John, is your motive just to expose that person? Oh, come on, church. Because listen, folks. God sent Ezekiel to a valley not to expose problems. Oh, come on. Not to expose sin. He came to put people back together and hearts back together and minds back together and people back into a place where they have unity, life, hope, and identity. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Lift your hands toward heaven right now. Father, we thank you for your word. It's a lamp unto our feet, and it's a light upon our path. I thank you for what you're doing right now within the sound of my voice. I ask you right now, God, that every single person in this room tonight, that, Father, that came here tonight, that you would download your spirit I pray that we would walk in empathy. We would undo shame in our nation. We would have a heart to walk among people in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen and amen. Can we give God a shout of praise right now? Are you glad you came to church? Are you glad you came to the house of God tonight? Ma'am, you're already standing if you just come out in the center aisle. I just... Uh, want to pray for you. Could I get someone to stretch forth your hands? Could I get one of the ladies, uh, uh, Sister uh, Rose, could you come and help me um, and just put your hand on our, our sister? Congregation, stretch forth your hands for her. When you stood up, the Spirit of God quickened me 
that you were standing up for justice because you were you've had some injustice happen to you. I just want to let you know that God's going to use you to speak the truth. God's going to use you to show the truth, and the truth is going to vindicate you. It's going to vindicate your heart. It's going to vindicate your family. Simply because, um, there have been times when you've had to apply the word. But you were the only one that walked among them. They didn't see it. They didn't, they didn't see from your perspective. That's the world that you're in. People are going to come alongside you. Um, people that you never thought would. Not because you manipulated them or coerced them or told them your story and decided to go on and share your heart with them. But I'm going to say something to you. God wants to use you to be a voice to the broken. People that are scattered and disconnected in this world. Because they've been so marginalized and unwanted and unloved that they feel like, what's the use? What's this gift? What's this worth to me? And I want you to be a voice of reconciliation. You've seen people that are close to you challenged by the world. Go through things that were horrific that I'm sure the way the world can be. And we're going to pull the shame out of them. And we're going to cover them and redeem them so they can come out from behind the tree and feel the love of God. Father, from the top of her foot, to the sole of her feet. Touch her right now in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. There it is. God is touching you right now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can we give God a shout of praise right now? Can we give God a shout of praise in the house? I want everyone to stand all over the room. I want everyone to stand all over the room. How many tonight want to walk among them? How many want to walk among them? My brother, could you come here? Could you come here? Yes. Just stand right here. Could you please? Just lift your hands toward heaven right now. I'm just going to say this. Thank you, the Lord says, for walking among the weak. There's going to be a strong ministry of what we call humanitarian aid that you're going to release. I, I, I don't know what this means, but I kept seeing this when we walked up here. I saw a, a, a truckloads of supplies, food, clothes all kinds of supplies uh, where, you know, that, that you were, that it was an operation that you were going to do on a community. And it wasn't that you, you, you wanted to keep people poor, but you wanted to use it as a platform to walk among people. And the Lord says you're going to win hearts of people that normally would not walk in through these doors because of your generosity. And the Spirit of the Lord says, says you know what, you shouldn't even be alive right now. You, you, when you were in your 40s, you, you, I mean, you did some stuff that was crazy, crazy, crazy. And I heard the word of the Lord say, but see, when, 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 when all kinds of chemicals were in your body, I breathed on you, and I released that from your body, and I caused it to leave your body, and I gave you life, and I put you back because you're going to walk in a valley, son, but what you're going to do as you're going to transform places that most people are afraid of because there isn't anything you're not afraid of. You've seen so much. You, you've seen you've seen violence. You've seen all kinds of crazy things. It's not going to shake you. But what you're going to do is you're going to bring my kingdom in a place where nev no one would ever expect the kingdom to show up. That's what I've called you to do. Father, from the top of this head to the sole of his feet. Touch him right now in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. There it is. God 
is touching you right now. Come on and give God a praise in the house. Give him a praise right now. What I, Andrew, I didn't see you. Andrew and Rose, I want you guys to come up here. I, I, I wanted to pray for you guys. How many, how many love this couple? How many love this couple? How many love this couple? I want you to stretch forth your hands to him, if you would please. And I'd ask my wife to come. I just heard the word this morning. I don't have it. Maybe you would like to ask some of your significant other to come here. About prosperity in the way that you love your spouse. And the reason why he brought that prosperity to you is he said that in the middle of blessing, Because of your humility, the Lord has promoted you. He's promoted you in the spirit, son, because he's raising you up to be able to do things that you wished. The type of prophet that sees, sees what's possible in the middle of an environment of impossibility, that sees a solution when everybody else sees and I saw this I saw this this is going to happen I don't know when but I saw I saw you when you're standing there in your city of vision you're completely confused about what to do and you walk in and they say Andrew do you have anything to say and as if the voice of God comes through you and brings solutions to city issues to bring solutions that are God given solutions you've done it in your business you'll do it You'll do it in the poly, you'll do it in the city hall. You, you'll you'll do it in people's lives because you're not a willing. You're not afraid of sharing your truth in the midst of an environment because people are dying to hear the truth, son. And I'm going to use you as my instrument of truth in your generation. The Lord says to you, Rose, that you have you you have come alongside your husband and you have been that encouraging, that one that pushes him forward, pushes that forward, pushes that forward, and you have not demanded things from him, and you have allowed him to grow and thrive, but the Lord says, daughter, I've given you a ministry that is going to come alongside your husband, <coughs> that literally, you're going to challenge the powers of darkness. You're going to break strongholds over people's lives. Your intercession and your prayer life is going to break strongholds in, in places you guys, I'm going to take you guys, I'm going to take you places in South America. I'm going to take you places in Central America. I'm going to take you places in Asia. I'm going to take you to Thailand. I'm going to take you to places like Cambodia. I'm going to take you to places like Laos and Vietnam and South a Asia. And you're going to break strongholds, Rose. And you're going to see miracles begin to happen because you're going to actually bring people out of sex trafficking and, and out of that lifestyle into a place of freedom. Then you're going to rescue many people, many men many young boys and many women you're going to rescue them and the Lord says I'm going to put a burden on you and, there, and I'm going to prosper your business I'm going to, where you're going to actually have a, a ministry uh, 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 facility there in Southeast Asia that brings people out of this, this bondage into a place of safety hope where they, they can get trained and used and then sent out and the Lord says I'm going to prosper what is in your hand even right now and the Lord says that there's going to be a day when, when, when I literally hand the, you're going to hand the baton. You'll always oversee. Simply place, you always will be a marketplace minister. You will always have that. But the Lord says there's going to be a day when the income is going to be enough. Because you, even though you're working and laboring as much as you can, your heart is want to walk among the people as Ezekiel did. And the, and the Lord says, I'm going to give you permission to do that, son. That there's going to be a day when you'll just walk away. And the, it, you'll still be owning it. You'll still have it. But you'll walk away from it and be full time in the work of the Lord. I'm speaking that right now. Because that is your heart, son. And the, and the Lord says that you won't have to worry about where it's going to come from. Because I'm going to show myself supernaturally. 
that, that even right now you're in the process of looking for management and people that can lead. And the Lord says that I'm going to give you an anointing to empower others to learn to lead others. The Lord says that I'm going to send people to you that have great people skills. Because a person can be greatly talented in their field, but if they don't know how to deal with people, they're ineffective. And the Lord says, I'm going to give you people that have the people skills like you do, and I'm going to impart that anointing to them, and you're going to empower people to deal with conflict, deal with customers, deal with challenges, and they're going to do it well, says the Lord. Father, I bless them right now. I bless this couple. I bless them from the top of their head to the sole of their feet. I thank you for their lives. Use them for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Can we give God a shout of praise in the house? Hallelujah. 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 How many want to walk among people? Come on, how many want to walk among people? If that's the cry of your heart. I want to change the atmosphere. If that's the cry of your heart, this is what I want you to do. On the count of three, I want you to run to this altar. One, two, three. Come right now. 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 Come closer. Come closer. Come closer. Come closer. Come closer. The presence of God is in this room right now. The presence of God is in this room right now, ladies and gentlemen. The presence of God is in this place. This week, Brother Mark Diado, I want you to pray in the spirit all over the room. Let me hear you. Pray in the spirit. Shut up, Kutia. Shut up, Kutia. Shut up, Kutia. Sir, just lift your hands right where you're at. I want you to look me in the eye. When you were standing there, I heard the Lord say, He has a huge He needs to connect with the right people. He needs to meet the right person and people, plural. And I heard the Lord say, you've been kind of just gooey around, just you. But your business is getting ready to expand in a way you've never known. I'm literally going to connect you with people that are going to see what you have and they're going to sovereignly with the favor of God steward you. The word reconciliation actually means to bring people back into favor with one another. I'm bringing you into a place of reconciliation with people you never thought you would connect to. Not just people of your, uh, of your own culture, but They're going to see what you bring to the table, son. That you have a viable place, and we want what you bring to the table. But do not forget where it came from. Do not forget where the blessing came from. Don't get so busy that you forget the house of God. You forget the grace of God. That you forget what he has done. Because if you'll 
stay in that place, I promise you. I promise you, son. I will go beyond what you dreamed of. I'll go beyond what you thought of. I'll go beyond what you could imagine. Father, from the top of his head to the sole of his feet. Father, touch him right now. Touch him right now. Touch him right now. Lord Jesus, we decree and declare, oh God, he has gone through things. There has been barriers, but tonight the barriers are gone right now. There are no more barriers, says the Lord. Touch him right now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on and give God a shout of praise. Come on and give him a shout. Sister D, can, Sister D, can you lay your hands on this young lady right here? This young lady right here, yes, yes, yes. This, I, I, I just feel, I, 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 I feel I needed to do this. I felt like I needed to do this. I felt like I needed this. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you my belt, and I want you to give it back to me. figure it out. We need a mentor. We need help. I heard the voice of the Lord say, daughter, I'm breaking your leg over. I'm breaking the chain. I didn't call you to be put under so much pressure you could not believe. See, when we do things because of pressure, rather than presence, then that's when we make the biggest mistakes of our life. And God tonight says, don't give in to the pressure. What I speak out of the presence, what I speak from peace, not what I speak from tension, not the pull, because you felt like your family, friends pulling at you, because tonight you needed this word. Because this word is saving your destiny and saving your future. Because daughter, there's something about you that is so unique and special that God has created you. This is what it is. It's the ability to bring people into deep emotional healing. To free them from their trauma. Simply because you have something we call empathy. You care. You have compassion. It burns in you. That's why sometimes you pick up stuff. And you go, what is this? What's going on? What, why am I seeing this all the time? It's because you're going, one day you're actually going to be able to do something about it. Father, from the top of her head to the sole of her feet. Touch her right now in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen and amen. There it is. God is touching you right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on and give God a shout of praise. Give him a shout of praise. Give him a shout of praise in the house. I want you to put your hand on your heart right now. I want you to say this after me. Jesus, here I stand in your presence tonight. Lord God, I'm called to change the atmosphere. 
I don't submit to the atmosphere that doesn't look like you or represent you. I change it. I transform it. Because I'm carrying your word and your truth and your power. Lord Jesus, tonight, help me to feel what you feel. I give you permission, God, to pick me up and put me where I needed the most. Not just where I want to go or what I want to do, but where I'm needed. Lord God, empower me to walk among others, to see them set free, healed, born again, delivered, encouraged, equipped, and empowered. Lord Jesus, I believe that these bones, my nation, my city, my family, where I work, my church, the church, I believe that they can live. And right now, God, I submit my will to your thoughts. Lord Jesus, I will speak to the bones. I will prophesy life and hope in Jesus' name. Now lift your hands and thank him all over this house. Thank him all over this house. Thank him all over the house tonight. We thank you, God. We thank you. We thank you. Meliana, could you just quickly lay hands on me? Just worship, just worship, just worship him. Just worship him. Just worship him. God, we adore you. God, we adore you. We adore you, God. We adore you. We adore your name. Your name is great. You are powerful, oh God. You are awesome, you. You do what nobody can do. Andrew, if you could just help me lay hands on people. Pastor Cal, could you just lay hands on people? Just release the anointing. Just release the glory of God. Lord, release the prophetic spirit upon every single person within the sound of my voice tonight. Continue your miracle, God. Within our sister right now. There it is. God is healing you right now. God's healing you. God's healing you right now. God is healing you. God's healing you. God's touching you, ma'am. God's touching you. God's touching you. giving you grace and hope. God's touching you, young lady. God's touching you. God's touching you. I heard the word of the Lord for you. I saw you kneeling down. This is a vision, and then I'll explain it, what it means. Saw a cloth like an anointed cloth in both of your hands, not just one, both. And I saw you kneel down on the wood floor that had been stained. The floor was stained. And I heard the 
voice of the Lord say, daughter, what's in your hand can remove this problem. And the Lord says this, on your knees, you will remove more stones than all you've done when you are running here or an elder who you would like to stay in a way for anointing on your life to undo the stain of sin and darkness that has been placed on the people you have known and loved and and you're in that one-on-one individual sitting up at Starbucks, sitting in a place one-on-one to help them and more to see you through the particular stain and go Your words have power. So Jesus, I just ask you to touch them. There's a, there's a strong spirit touching that room right now. Please touch them. Touch them. God bless these men. Lord Jesus, when they go to honor you, they're not going to be honored. They want to bring people into the love of God and an encounter with Jesus. I pray that you would use their hands. I would use every part of their movement to bring the people into encounter with the love of God. I pray for favor. I pray for everything that they need, every detail that they need. I pray for that right now. They're not performers. They're worshipers. They're worshipers. And there's a difference. That you're not looking for worshipers. You're looking. You're not looking for performers. You're looking for worshipers. Those that worship you in spirit and truth. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that there will be many women that get saved in this generation because they say yes. There are many people called into ministry as a Hallelujah. 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 She'll have so much empathy back that that which is disconnected has to come to her. Barry, I heard the word of the Lord. Something that's been disconnected for 11 years, let me do my math. Something that's been disconnected from since 2007 is going to come together because God's going to use you and give you the right revelation to bring the bone back together. It's going to happen. Because what God has done is God has shaped you. He has molded you. He has made you. He has tempered you. He has has really refined you in the fire. Refined you. 
you're not going to melt. You're not going to melt. You're not going to be speechless, clueless. The Lord is really going to put confidence on the inside. Not that you didn't have confidence, but it's not a confidence in you. It's a confidence in Him. It's a reliance on Him. And Jesus said, I don't do anything without seeing what my Father is doing. Do what my father is doing. Father, touch your life. Hallelujah. 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 I want every head bowed, every eye closed for a moment. I want to do something. time I would have unpacked it more but I felt like before I give the mic to Pastor Sal Apostle Sal there's a number of people here you're dealing with shame you're dealing with shame and that shame has silenced you So when we wear the garment of shame, our identity, who we are, we never come to who we are or the knowledge of who he is in us simply because of shame. Remember this. God didn't just come to the garden to discipline us. He came to the garden to undo shame. He came in the ark because he's not... See, so many times we get concerned about evil. He wasn't concerned. He wasn't interested in the serpent. He wasn't interested in Adam and Eve. The Father's not interested in evil. He's interested in human beings. And if you're here tonight and you say, Preacher, I've dealt with shame and I want to get completely free from it. Completely. On the count of three, if that's you, I want you to raise your right hand right now. One, two, three. See that hand. See that hand. See that hand. Church, there are people around you that have their hands lifted. I want you to go around. I want you to lay your hand on them. And once you have, and once you have, have someone lay hand on you, once you have someone lay hand on you, put your hand down. There's someone right here, right here. Someone lay hand on our, our sister right here. Someone lay hand on our sister right over here. Right over here. Right here, right here, kneeling down. Yes. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, when I lay my hand on this precious woman, on your precious daughter, I release a peace on her. See, there is a peace that transcends our understanding. See, you're super intelligent. You are super, super intelligent. So intellectualism and knowledge, it has always come easy for you. And it has literally been your crutch, but at the same time, it's also gotten away from the Spirit of God. But God wants me to tell you, I'm going to sink you going to put you in sync. I'm going to put you in sync with that incredible intelligence. I'm going to give you a sensitivity to my spirit, says the Lord. It's my gift to you. My gift to you. That sensitivity of the spirit is going to bypass even the things you learned in school that you're not going to lean on your education. The Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 5 says, who is this coming out of the wilderness, leaning upon their lover? Let me just tell you, you have come out of the wilderness, leaning on Jesus. Because you've leaned on Jesus, Jesus is going to show himself to you. Because God's going to use that intellect of yours. 
that great mind of yours. Not only will you have the, the ability to articulate and to speak and to connect, to touch the mind, but God is now giving you the ability to touch that soul, to touch that heart, to change the heart. Get ready. You're going to step into a classroom and bring impact to people. They don't even know what's coming. They don't even know what's coming. Father, from the top of her head to the sole of her feet, touch her right now. There it is. The shame is gone right now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, put your hands together now. Maybe you have something in your hands. I said, put your hands together now and give God a praise. Hallelujah. Come on, you may return to your seats. It's, this is called soaking. You soaked a little bit in the presence of a God. We haven't soaked on Sunday evenings in quite a while. We ought to start doing a little bit more often. Hallelujah.